am Jim Zogby. Welcome to Viewpoint. We're in the midst of a political campaign season with presidential candidates debating issues of concern to the American people and the world. As the season progresses, we'll be examining many of these issues and what the candidates are saying about them. But if past this prologue, one set of concerns will get short shrift on issues involving the Middle East. They won't be discussed. Since the end of the Vietnam War, the U.S. has sent more money, sent more weapons, and uh, fought more wars, lost more lives, and experienced more uh, tragedy in the Middle East than anywhere in the world, and we've expended more political capital, but we rarely see candidates engage in substantive discussion of Middle East issues. Tonight we'll look at what some of the candidates are saying and what they're not saying. And I want to welcome Maya Berry, Executive Director of the Arab American Institute. She served as Legislative Director to David Bonnier, the Minority Whip in Congress, and then founded a consulting firm, uh, which she ran for a number of years before taking the helm at AI. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, Jim. Um, I want to look at the issues uh, that are talked about, the issues that are not talked about, and the way that they're talking about it. I want to take each party um, and each issue, if we could, and go down the line. First, I want to look at the Republican side. Uh, it's interesting to me that on the Republican side, uh, we started with a, a single candidate uh, who was reflecting a kind of an isolationist view, Rand Paul, mm -hmm. but has recently been joined by Donald Trump, I think, who either caught the libertarian bug or the isolationist bug, and has started challenging um, candidates. Before I do that, I want to look at the, what the, the more mainstream mm -hmm. view is. Uh, let's look at uh, Ted Cruz, for example, a uh, hardline view on Iran, um, saying, if I'm elected president, I instruct the Department of Justice to start persecuting. I don't think he meant that quite literally. <laughs> Religious liberty and then cancel the Iran deal and move the U.S. Embassy from Israel to Jerusalem. Tough talk from him. And then Carly Fiorina joining in saying that uh, on the very first day she'd make two phone calls and the first one would be to my good friend Bibi that we stand with the state of Israel. Uh, that kind of hard line view and and more aggressive stance is the more typical Republican approach, isn't it? You know, it is, and uh, regrettably so. And, and I think this is the kind of conversation we see, uh, you'll recall, a, a little early in the year when uh, Sh Sheldon Adelson was convening the group in, in Las Vegas. They called it the, the, the Sheldon primary, with the idea being that these candidates who are seeking um, his support and his uh, significant campaign contributions in the form of super facts that are extraordinary in terms of the amount of resources they can put in play, uh, that they were looking for positioning themselves on Israel as I am better than better than better and it just kept going up <laughs> to, to a point where I think reasonable voices um, are, are sort of uh, silenced on this and that is very problematic and then you add the Trump factor where frankly I have no idea where Donald Trump stands on on the issues of Israel Palestine um, and partly because he really can get away with saying both things in in a way um, that that's very problematic and someone like Senator Cruz <coughs> They're all fighting for that oxygen. They're all fighting for that space. So he's going to keep amp upping the ante and trying to say something that gets headlines that, that Trump really is taking away. But the aggressive sort of uh, militarist approach, mm -hmm. um, I'm canceling this, I'm doing that, we're talking tough. Uh, Lindsey Graham uh, wanting to do more, John McCain-like bombing Syria, uh, people even calling for military intervention in Syria. That's, that's the kind of discourse that is more typical on this side right now. And it is, and, and it's extraordinary in that it almost fails to completely acknowledge what has happened <laughs> with regards to U.S. policy in the region and since the initial Iraq war. Um, it simply doubles down on a flawed approach of that time. And instead of having pushback, like I think you do see from some sort of more reasonable foreign policy experts on the Republican side, you have a primary underway where it's going to move them further in that direction. And, and it is about um, um, looking at the military as an option first, foremost, perhaps only. A lot of the is criticism of the president. Mm -hmm. um, it's driven, I think, to some extent by Obama's weak, Obama has betrayed us, he's let us down. This leading um, from behind narrative. Yeah. If, if you choose to examine policies and suggest that there may be a diplomatic approach here, that it is not as simple as creating no-fly zones, that we have to 
pursue diplomatic options with Iran because the alternative would get us to a place where we don't have compliance with our nuclear objectives and at the same time potentially facing yet another military engagement. Those are things that are simply put away with wonderful sound bites that say he's, he's failed us on the world stage, leaning from behind hasn't worked, I will step in and I will make phone calls, I will make declaratives, I will do all of that. Uh, Donald Trump set off a firestorm. In the last debate, um, Jeb Bush made two comments that were pretty much ignored. Um, one was, my brother kept us safe. That's mm -hmm. one thing he did. He kept us safe. And the other was, he said, um, we were more, America was more popular uh, at the end of my brother's administration than, 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 than today. Um, Donald Trump picked up on the, he kept us safe. And let's listen to what um, Jeb said first. Here's Jeb Bush talking about uh, what his brother did. As it relates to my brother, there's one thing I know for sure. He kept us safe. And then Donald Trump uh, let that go for a, a couple of days and then came back with, shot back with the following. When you talk about George Bush, I mean, say what you want, the World Trade Center came down during his time. Uh, if you look Hold at on, Sandy that, Hook, you can't blame George Bush yeah, for that. Really? He was president, okay? Don't blame him or don't blame him, but he was president. The World Trade Center came down during his reign. Peter Beinart, who writes in The Atlantic and is one of my favorite writers, actually, um, had the following to say. He uh, had a comment about it saying that uh, there's no way of knowing for sure if Bush could have stopped September 11 attack. That's not the right question. The right question is, did Bush do everything he could reasonably to stop it, them? And uh, what, given what he knew at the time, he didn't. It's not even close. Uh, Peter also s had some comments about uh, 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 Trump's criticism of the Iraq war. Um, Trump has criticized the Iraq war. He's warning against any military involvement in Syria. Uh, and he's taking on 9-11, saying that George Bush didn't keep us safe. I have two questions. First is, um, how does this play in the Republican Party with the Republican constituency? Does Donald Trump have a constituency for that? And secondly, how do we evaluate the, the, that entire set of comments? I mean, do, we, do you agree with uh, Beinart's uh, assessment of it? Uh, but first of all, how does it play in the Republican Party? I, I think what's, what's interesting about what Trump has done successfully in terms of this primary with regards to Governor Bush is this phrase that, that he kept repeating and seems to have stuck, this low energy candidate. If, if you want to disagree with Bush on policy matters, you can do so at the debate and you can even call him out to task the way that you did in these. But what's interesting about this is it's this issue I mean, anytime you talk about September 11th, as you know, <laughs> it's incredibly problematic, it's incredibly heavy, it's incredibly intense, and, and he has a way of being able to use the words so loosely that it's not, even if you agree with the substance of Peter, you don't end up in the same place as Donald Trump does. And it's just this consistent, I think, um, and generally effective way of dismissing Bush as this viable candidate. He's being told, look, I've been, you know, today was the 100th day of him leading in the polls. So we're all supposed to believe it's this big deal that Donald Trump has now been in the lead for a, an extensive period of time. At the same time, the, the one who's supposed to be the leading candidate, the best we have going for him right now is we're being told by his own operatives is, look, the super PAC still has a lot of money. When these guys fizzle out, we'll be fine. Trump is really, I think, effectively conveying to those primary voters, listen, you want to believe that, but that's not the case and you know it. And, it, and I think raising things like September 11th, raising things like mistakes around the Iraq war, um, even when he talks about the Iran deal, it's opposing the president, but at the same time suggesting, you know, I'll do this in a way that's completely different. And, and I think that's worked. I think that's worked with a certain level of, of these primary voters. That, that has been a real problem for the establishment candidates, all of them. And it's altering the Republican debate, which mm -hmm. has, I mean, for whatever criticism one might offer of Ted Cruz or, mm -hmm. or, or, or Carly Fiorina or Mike Huckabee, it's a, it's a cleaner, straightforward approach. And the Donald Trump one does muddy the waters a mm -hmm. bit. Mm -hmm. It's not libertarian like, um, uh, like Rand Paul. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's not hawkish either. One right. doesn't quite know what it is. Right. Um, and yet it's becoming the dominant thread in the Republican debate today because everyone is either agreeing with or reacting to Donald Trump. And that's the point. They're constantly <coughs> responding to a narrative he sets. And as a result of that, I think they're going to continue to lead the, lose those conversations. One thing I want to I get into is just we talked about the Israeli-Palestinian issue and then we let it go. Um, there have been plenty of criticisms uh, offered Republicans and Democrats alike about Barack Obama handling that issue. Um, there were criticisms of George W. handling the issue. Um, 
but one wonders what comes next. Mm -hmm. uh, clearly on the Republican side, um, the rhetoric has been um, clearly one-sided, mm -hmm. uh, more so than we saw even in the, the 2000 and 2004 election when George Bush won. Um, one wonders what happens to this issue uh, if Republicans win. Um, correct, and and I think it's um, um, it is the it's the this president has failed you. He's let down our key ally, our best friend in the region, um, and therefore we would never do that. And the ways in which they highlight those points have to do with military agreements to Jerusalem, to even now um, as the, the violence in the region is imploding, you have uh, presidential candidates who are engaging in Twitter conversations that are sort of in some ways profoundly confusing. You're, you're a major presidential candidate and, and you're choosing to get into the debate this way. Uh, they did the same thing around, if you recall, the Prime Minister's visit, Bibi Netanyahu's visit to Congress, uh, where they were pretty comfortable openly uh, coming out in support of him and in, in opposition to, to President Obama on that. I think that's certainly very problematic and it, what it's done is it, it allows us to have this this political conversation and very little around issues of policy. Um, and that's, I think that's problematic. When they position themselves on this issue, it's not about a thoughtful position on how to move forward to get out of the, the occupation we're dealing with, to address the problems that we have. It's about, I will stand with you forever. Let's look at the Democratic side um, and start with what became an issue during the debate, unlike the Republican situation where the debate didn't erupt until after the debate. Uh, in the Democratic debate, it occurred during the debate with everyone piling on Hillary Clinton for her, I guess the word would be militarism, her option to use military first. Um, it started with um, um, uh, Bernie Sanders mm -hmm. uh, and Lincoln Chafee piling on about the Iraq War and her vote on the Iraq War. Let's look at uh, Bernie, Bernie Sanders calling the Iraq the worst foreign policy blunder in the history of the country. Um, and then Lincoln Chafee uh, saying, following that, that uh, questioning the judgment of the person. No, this is not the quote I want to use because this is the quote on, on Syria. But uh, it, what he said was, um, if you voted for that, I question the judgment to be the, the commander in chief. Tell me a little about that uh, and, and whether or not with the Democratic constituency, uh, is the Iraq vote still an issue or is it not an issue? Is Bernie barking up the wrong tree or has Hillary Clinton's, uh, n the negatives around that vote, has it passed? You know, I think it <coughs> continues to be an issue primarily because of, uh, frankly, the, the base that, that uh, Senator Sanders is turning out in these, in these locations across the country. Um, Secretary Clinton has a generally hawkish sort of position on issues, some issues of foreign policy, certainly in, among the Democratic field that's in play now. And what she's had to do in these community events that she's done, at these rallies, um, she's, she's, she's the only one in the field who supported it. And I think there is a reason to answer to that, especially as we look at what are we doing when we move forward on Syria. So you do have a situation where that Iraq vote is now put in the context of her saying, I support a no-fly zone. And my understanding of that statement is she made that statement to a local reporter in Boston. And as you know, once it's said, it's said, and you don't back away from it. Um, so I think that combined with the vote from 2003 leads folks to sort of say, where, where are you on this? And, and I also think it's an interesting balancing act that she plays out with the president's policies on this. Because there are times when she gets to say, I was the Secretary of State for the Obama administration, and I did the following. And other times where she say, I was supporting my president, and I would choose to do this differently. Um, I think that's a very difficult tightrope in some ways, <laughs> um, and it's, uh, it's one that uh, she has to continue to, uh, to walk carefully. Let's look at the Chafee, Chafee quote. It, it actually was about the Iraq War, and what he was saying was that the U.S. unfortunately bears a great deal of responsibility for the refugee crisis because mm. of our invasion of Iraq and spread of chaos in the region as well. Uh, <coughs> and, um, uh, and then uh, O'Malley. Um, uh, he had something, Governor O'Malley had a comment about Syria challenging Clinton on the no-fly zone. Let's look at that. As president, I would not be so quick to pull for a military tool. I believe the no-fly zone in Syria would be a mistake, with the others chiming in as well, uh, that it would also be a mistake. So you literally had the four Democrats mm -hmm. on, on stage um, piling on. Uh, Mrs. Clinton, as the, uh, the, the militarist who would be made the wrong choice then and would make the wrong choice now, 
looking forward to the rest of this Republican, this Democratic Party debate, how is this going to play out? Is it going to be uh, a decisive issue? It's the only foreign policy issue Democrats talked about at all was the use of force. Is it a, a deciding question in the Repo in the Democratic Party? Clinton's numbers don't seem to indicate that it is. Uh, or 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 will it will it, is it will it just fade? I think because it draws a contrast between her and the other candidates uh, with regards to uh, military positioning, I think it will continue to be there. I, and and I say that because again, it's the progressive base that's really these issues are now drawing the primary voter that tends to lean more left. It may be that Hillary's position on the Iraq war or Hillary's position on Syria or what she ends up articulating on <coughs> Palestine Israel will play better if she is indeed the nominee and she's running in a general election. But for a primary voter, this is still a level of discomfort for two reasons. One, again, it's, it's partly a problematic failed policy that we've had in place, and people are very, very weary of that legitimately. And two, you're not backing the Democratic president. You're not backing mm -hmm. the, 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 the party in office um, and, and, and the one you hope to succeed. I think those are still issues. Not wanting to pile as well on Hillary Clinton, <laughs> but there was a comment she made about Libya, mm -hmm. uh, which I thought was, was interesting. She was asked about Libya, uh, and to, t you know, was she pleased with what happened there? And here's what she said. She said, our response, which I think was smart power at its best, is that the United States um, will not lead this. Rather, what we would do is we'd bring a coalition together and do it, ignoring completely, as she went on, what Libya is today. Yeah. Um, the dictator is gone, but the country is now a failed state, and there are literally hundreds of people dying almost every day from internal war and a, a rise of uh, extremist groups that have literally checkerboarded the country uh, with rival factions. Um, I, I think that's actually, the, if, if, if I were to see a foreign policy discussion, a meaningful one at, at the debates, whether it's the Republican or the Democrats, it really would be addressing these issues because you're looking at Libya, you're looking at Iraq, you're looking at Syria, you're looking at Yemen, you're, you're basically looking at at least four different failed states. And, and places like Jordan and Lebanon, deeply impacted by the global refugee crisis that's taking place there. And are the folks ready to take over the Oval Office have not conveyed that they're ready to have sort of a really meaningful discussion on those issues. And I think that's problematic. Let's look at Israel-Palestine mm -hmm. just for a moment. Um, the question is going to be, um, what we've got is a, on the, the Democratic side, We've got one view, and the Republican side, another view. Can we look at the polling on that uh, just for a second? Um, the, uh, the Israel becoming a partisan Isra issue. Yeah, it, it has become a partisan <laughs> issue. I just want to put those numbers up. Uh, here it is on the, no, it's not. OK, uh, we lost it. Uh, it's up on the screen right now. Uh, it shows. Uh, Literally a red state, blue state situation, uh, a, a situation where Democrats are on one side uh, and believe that Israel should, America should pursue its own interest if there's a conflict with Israel. Republicans feeling we should always support Israel, whatever its view is. Uh, given that that's where the two parties are, um, to what extent are the candidates reflecting that? Clearly on the Republican side they are. Are Democrats reflecting where the base is? Uh, I think <coughs> some are increasingly reflecting where the base is, and, and, but this is an incredible contrast in terms of numbers. Um, I mean, we saw this, and you could speak to this in terms of the pollings you've done over the years, where we started to see before that sort of mainstream headlines declared Israel becoming a partisan issue, we started to see this divide around white male Republicans ending up, older Republicans ending up in one camp and sort of women, younger voters ending up in another with regards to Palestine and Israel. This is incredible because the question asks interest first, right? Even if it's the, our own interests are, are not, the 67 percent of Republicans were saying that's how they should move forward. I think that the Democrats are looking at this um, first there was this element of the, the administration is wrapping up. There's a little bit over a year to, to do. And then we've got the Iran deal. Now that the Iran deal, there's hope that the president would pivot to that part of the world and try to get us back to a place of something. And then we have this outbreak of violence. And I think that's really left a lot of people in a place of confusion about what is best in terms of moving forward. I mean, w talking about the violence in the context of occupation 
is um, is difficult for some of these candidates, regrettably. It's not the context in which they, they approach these issues. And I think um, that's also really interesting in terms of how it plays out. I mentioned that some of the Republicans feel comfortable just jumping into this on social media, not a place where you can engage in a lot of substance. And sometimes I think the silence of the Democrats on the other side about some of that is, is more constructive than doing what we're seeing on the Republican side. So the Carly Fiorina quote from before, would play well on the Republican side. Yes, absolutely. But it's not going to play well on the Democratic side. Nor do I think it ends up playing well among independent voters and a general primary because people don't go to the, the majority of people don't go to vote for president based on the Israel-Palestine conflict. And they certainly don't want a candidate who's willing to say, put Israel's interests ahead of the United States, the way some would suggest in that. And how does, the, how does the, the, the strong uh, military approach play? Uh, on the Republican side, it works. Mm -hmm. Uh, they want a muscular foreign policy. Uh, on the Democratic side, it, it doesn't work. How does it play in the general? I think in the general, <coughs> we, we, you know, we've had from Iraq and Afghanistan and with the president's new announcement that we can't really do the withdrawal that we were hoping we would do. Well, there is an, an absolute sense of fatigue around these issues. Um, and I think you see it. You know, Rand Paul successfully did this in the beginning where he's like, we're not going to police the world and we should. I mean, he can't. He's not really leading that conversation anymore. And it's not even the same conversation the same way. Um, so I think it continues to play out. Um, it, among some groups, but for general primary voters, there is a sense of, look, the region's not doing well. The world is, is too complicated and not going well. Can we turn inward? Can we do what we need to do on these issues? Not quite isolationist, but at the same time, not ready to do the kind of military engagement that they basically saw in, in years past. Let me take one final crack at, at Jeb Bush, uh, his comment about um, the fact that the president, uh, during his brother's tenure, America was twice as popular or was more popular. Um, looking at the numbers from the Pew polls, uh, which have done these uh, contrast numbers for uh, several, several years now, going back to 2007 and coming up to 2015, the numbers just don't, don't indicate that at all. Um, and, and so I wonder it, it, the degree to which Obama was greeted internationally with a tremendous sigh of relief that it wasn't going to be the aggressive isolationist, not isolationist, but unilateral United mm -hmm. States. And, and they're now disappointed, but the numbers still aren't as low as they were. Um, what would happen if we come back again with a version of uh, uh, the first George Bush term, the, the, the more militarist, aggressive, and unilateralist uh, America? How does that play, not just here in America, but how does it play in the world? I, I think um, um, I think Governor Bush has a lot of difficulty any time that he talks about his brother as president. I think it's a very difficult um, set of eight years to, to work, uh, not just for primary voters, but for conservative Republican voters. The, the growth of government under, under President Bush was extraordinary. And there are people who say, Jeb may be a true conservative, and he led that way as governor of Florida, but there are a lot of things that his brother's administration did that even that core group is, is weary of. So I think there's, it's very hard for him any time we're having the discussion around that. In terms of today's sort of movements around the military piece, it's, it's really Senator Graham that I find very interesting on this, because I think he's articulating that more effectively than Governor Bush. And, and when it's met with some examination, there are questions. When he says, this isn't going to cut it, you want to fight ISIL, 30,000 um, troops on the ground, they don't all have to be us, we can do it in, co in coalition, but we need that many. People are asking questions when yeah. it, it gets articulated that way. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. So we're going to follow this debate throughout the year, but it's interesting the candidates are talking, but not talking about several Middle East issues. It's all the time we've got for now. For information, you can follow us on Twitter at AAIUSA or check us out on our website, AAIUSA.org. Thanks for watching Viewpoint, and I'll see you next week.